In this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit more about complex numbers. We're going to talk about the reciprocal of a complex number, which is basically just 1 divided by a complex number. We're going to talk a little bit about what complex conjugate is, and then we're going to look at a more complicated problem than what we've seen in past presentations. So the reciprocal of a quantity is just 1 over that quantity, and that may be familiar if you think back to circuits. If you were adding resistors in parallel, you added those values as the reciprocal of the resistance, and so you can imagine that that might be important as we look at circuits in AC and we combine resistors, capacitors, and inductors together. So if we're going to look at the reciprocal of a complex number. We want our complex number in polar form. And so 1 over that complex number is the reciprocal. 1 is just a real number, and we can write that real number as 1 with a, an angle of 0. And then we can treat this as a complex number divided by another complex number. It just so happens that the top one only has a real part. So we know how to do division, and so I would take the um, the magnitude of each of those complex numbers, and I would divide, so I have 1 over c, and then I would subtract the angles, so 0 minus the angle. And so I can write the reciprocal of any complex number as just 1 over the magnitude of the complex number, and then with a phase angle of just negative whatever the complex um, number's angle actually was. So for example, if I wanted to take 1 over uh, 20 with an angle of 30. Um, I would take 1 over 20 and then my angle would be just negative of the angle of the complex number which would be negative 30. 1 over 20 is 0 0.005 and then the phase or the angle would be a negative 30. So 1 over 20 with an angle of 30 is equivalent to 0 0.05 with a phase angle of negative 30. Sometimes we may see um, something called a complex conjugate of a complex number. And a complex conjugate is denoted with an asterisk next to it. And what that means is that the complex number um, that you start with, so here's a complex number right here. It has a length, it has an angle, and then it has a real and imaginary part. The complex conjugate of that same complex number, there's the, um, the asterisk next to it, just means that you change the sign of the imaginary part of that complex number. So every place that you see a j, you make it a negative j, or you make it the opposite sign to what it was. And what that does to your complex number, when you look at the complex conjugate, it still has the same length associated with it, because if I take the real part squared and the imaginary part squared, I'm still going to get the same thing. Um, but what this does is it takes your complex number and it puts it in the um, sort of the reflection plane. So this would be in the first quadrant of the complex um, plane, and this would be in the fourth quadrant of the complex plane. And so what it does is it takes your angle and it makes it a negative angle. Why are complex conjugates important? Well, it turns out that if you multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, it actually provides the length of the phasor, or the length of the complex number. So if I take this complex number, multiply by the con complex conjugate, if I do that in the, the phasor notation or the polar notation, I would get c times c, so I get c squared, but then I would add the angles and it would give me zero, and of course this is just a real a real part. So the co a complex number multiplied by its own complex conjugate always gives you a real number, and that real number is always the length of the complex number squared. I could actually write this out. I can multiply complex numbers in rectangular form, and so let's just do it here. So I have my complex number, a plus jb, I have the complex conjugate, which I've switched the sign to a negative sign here, and now I'm going to multiply these. So this should look similar to things you saw in algebra, and you basically use that FOIL method. So I would take a, a times a, I get an a squared. I would take um, jb times a, and I get a jab, jab. And then I would take um, negative jab times a, 
and I get a negative JAB. And then I would multiply the imaginary parts together. So I have a negative J times a J. This gives me a negative J squared and then a B times a B. So the cross terms cancel each other out. And then this J squared, of course, is just negative 1. So I have minus times a negative 1. And it just gives me A squared plus B squared, which, of course, is just the length of the complex number squared. So complex conjugates are kind of nice to know a little bit about because you might want to have just a real part and you can do that by multiplying let's say the top and bottom of a fraction by a complex number to get rid of the complex part in the bottom of the fraction. We'll see more of that a little bit later on. No, no need to worry too much about it yet. Let's consider a more complicated example of adding, subtracting, multiplying a combination of complex numbers. So in this particular case, I have um, a number of complex numbers. And in some cases, there's addition. In some cases, there's multiplication. And I want to determine how I can take this complicated set of complex numbers and reduce it down to a single complex number that can be written in rectangular form and polar form. So in order to approach a problem like this, I need to use a step-by-step -step method where I'm going to break this into parts and I'm going to work on those parts uh, until I can break everything down into a single complex number. So the first thing I realize is that I have a, um, a complex number that's in rectangular form that's out front and then I'm going to add to it this other more complicated set of complex numbers. So the first, the term out front, I can probably leave alone right now because I want to add to it something else and I need to get everything that's in brackets reduced down to a complex number that's in rectangular form so that I can add it to this other complex number. So as I look at the terms that are in brackets, I realize that at the top I have two complex numbers that are being multiplied together. One of those complex numbers is already in polar form and the other one is in rectangular form. We know that with multiplication, I want both of the complex numbers to be in polar form, so I need to convert the rectangular piece into polar form. I also realize that at the bottom, I have the addition of two complex numbers. One of those complex numbers is already in rectangular form. The other term is in polar form, so I'm going to need to convert that into rectangular form in order to do addition. So I can take 3 minus 4j and I can convert that into a rectangular, excuse me, polar form. And that has a length of 5 and an angle of negative 53.1. I can also take um, the complex number at the bottom that is in polar form and I can convert that into rectangular form. And I, <clears throat> I can put that into my, I can replace that, those, those terms in my complex number. Now I have something where I can do multiplication on the top and I can do addition on the bottom. So if I multiply the two terms at the top, I get 5 times 10, which is 50. And then the angles I would add together, so I get a negative 13.1. If I add the complex numbers at the bottom, I would add their real parts and I would add their imaginary parts. And so I get a negative 12 for the real part and a positive uh, 16 for the imaginary part. And so now I can take those terms and I can replace them in my picture, keeping my complex number that I had out front there. I now want to divide two complex numbers. In order to do division, I need to make sure that I have both of the complex numbers in polar form. So I need to convert the bottom number into polar form. And when I do that, I have a real part of negative 12 and an imaginary part of 16. I can do 12 squared plus 16 squared square root. I get 20. If I were to put in my calculator the inverse tangent of 16 over minus 12, I would actually get a negative number. So with this particular complex number, it's really important that we understand 
how we get this answer right here. I would suggest that you draw a picture and realize that this complex number is in the second quadrant. And it has a, a vertical height of 16 and a length of 12. And so you have to make sure that you convert the angle that you get in the complex plane to a, an angle that's in the second quadrant. So I can now replace the bottom complex number with, um, with the polar form. Once I do that, I have two numbers that are, um, that are being divided by one another, complex numbers. And so I can divide those numbers. 20, excuse me, 50 divided by 20 is 2.5. And if I want to um, divide complex numbers, I subtract the angle. So I get a negative 144.3. So now I have a number that is in rectangular form and I want to add to it a number that is in polar form. Uh, in order to do addition, I need to convert the polar form of that number into rectangular form. And I can do that um, with the sines and cosine of this angle. Once I have it in rectangular form, I can plug that back in. And now I can add those values in rectangular form, adding the real parts first and then adding the imaginary parts. And I end up with uh, 3.97 for the real part and 3.54 for the imaginary part. And then once I find that, I can convert that back to um, polar form using the standard method um, it's Pythagorean's theorem and inverse tangent. So this is the way you would approach a, a more complicated problem dealing with complex numbers.